Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just waiting for my uh, co-host, uh, Will, to um, check in, and then we'll be uh, kicking off a little after two o'clock. Um, if you have any questions, um, please drop them into the Q&A panel, um, and we'll be addressing all of those um, as a kind of uh, job lot um, at the end of the slides, when we'll also be joined by uh, Ben Peacock, who is a recent, um, I believe, Oxford law grad, um, who's going to be helping us with some of the more subject-specific queries that I'm sure you've all brought to the table. Um, so I'm going to disappear onto mute for a little while. Um, and I'll rejoin you once Will is here, and then we'll uh, we'll kick things off. Fab and perfectly on time here as well. Hi Matt, how are you? I'm well. Um, enjoying my umpteenth consecutive weekend locked in my flat, but you know it's been worse. At least it's not raining today. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and you know it could be worse. We could live in Texas. You, there's also I don't know if you're a rugby man, but there's quite a big game on this afternoon. And the oh rug in the rugby is it is it clashing with this? Do we have to try and finish early? No, no, I think we'll be okay unless the Q and A lasts two hours, which I doubt it will. Oh well, that's a relief. <laughs> no, well, I'm I'm not much of a rugby fan, but I always I always enjoy a, a good sporting contest. So if that's if that's what I can okay. I can tune in for, then perhaps that's what I'll be doing at, at four o'clock or five o'clock or whenever it is. Yeah, I think it's about half four. It's England Wales, I think. Oh. See, my dad's the rugby fan. Um, okay. When you've met me, I'm not. I'm not really rugby shaped. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out there wasn't a role uh, for short and slow. Um, <laughs> I suppose there might be uh, in the pack, but also cowardly, uh, short, slow, and cowardly. They weren't in. Cowardly the won't help. Yeah. Fab. All right. Well, with that out of the way, um, <laughs> I think we'll. I think we'll kick things off. Um, so, uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us this week. Um, it's so nice to have um, people here when we when we do these, um, and we're yeah excited for the second week in a row to share with you our new our new slide templates, which are new and and slick and, and good looking. Um, this week we're going to be um, talking about um, applying to study law at Oxford and Cambridge. And we've got a, um, a law grad joining us for the Q&A, as I mentioned earlier, who'll be able to help with some of the, the finer points um, that Will or I are unaware of as non-lawyers. Um, and next week, we're going to be talking about um, applying to study PPE and economics, uh, the degree of prime ministers. So if you've been watching the news lately and um, thinking that you could do a better job, then you should join us next week for the um, lowdown on how to, how to put yourself in that um, in that process. And so if you me. want to be a prime minister, PPE at Christchurch seems to be the the highest correlate with prime minister success. I think there were the same number of prime ministers from Christchurch as from the whole of Cambridge or something along those lines. Were, were uh, are any of your prime ministers good? Uh, Gladstone. Yeah, okay, fair. I, I'd spent a lot of uh, A-level history learning about him, so he's always been a favourite of mine. Ah. Well, there you go. If you if you feel you could do a better, better job than Boris Johnson, who I believe is classics at Magdalen, um, then this is your opportunity to find out about it. I don't know what Keir Starmer did. He has a he has an Oxford air about him. Um, I'll have to look that up later on. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd be shocked if he had if he wasn't an Oxford an Oxford chap. They they always are somehow. Uh, yes, 
Oh no, he went to Leeds. Oh God. Oh, well, that's that's made me think twice. Um, so, um, what Keir Starmer should have done uh, is applied to study law at Oxford um, or Cambridge, both good. Um, so we're going to be looking at that over the next um, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and I've broken this up into kind of three, three areas. Um, the first one, do you want to be a lawyer? It's a question worth asking before you become one. Um, once you've decided um, how you make a case for yourself in terms of the, uh, the application. Um, and last of all, I'm going to touch briefly on conversion courses um, for people who discover that they would like to be a lawyer, um, but a little bit later on. Um, now, I've not introduced you because I still haven't put back in that slide, um, which is throwing things off. And I think I'm going to have to reinsert it, Will. Um, so before we proceed further, uh, Will, uh, remind us who you are and why yeah. it is that you're not a lawyer. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Will. I'm the lead consultant at Uni Missions. Um, so I'm sort of run the team who speaks to students, speaks with parents, talks about applications and makes recommendations and gives guidance. Um, I'm, I would say I'm not a lawyer because both my parents were lawyers and I saw the working hours associated and I decided from a very early age that that wasn't something that, that I uh, fancy for myself. Um, but of course, there are lots of good reasons to be a lawyer. Um, I think I would have done a pretty good job of it, actually. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a bad experience from youth. <laughs> so there you go. Um, my name is Matt. I look after our research here at Uni Admissions, um, which means that it's my job to make sure that everything uh, Will and the rest of the team advise the students and parents who talk to us is true, um, that we can back it up with graphs and data and things like that, mm. um, and to continually improve on that as, as time goes on. Um, I'm not a lawyer, although I did think about it when I was at school. Um, uh, as it goes, I then lived with um, and was best man at my wedding, um, a very close friend of mine who is a is a no a corporate um, corporate litigation barrister. Um, and if I had known how much money uh, you could be paid by being a lawyer, uh, maybe I would have become one. Um, because goodness me, she makes a lot of money. Um, but we're going to come to touch on that in a moment. Um, as uh, not everyone does. Um, so, uh, unlike me, maybe you want to be a lawyer. Hopefully you do, um, which is why you're here. Um, so why might you want to be a lawyer? Um, the first thing to say is there are a vast range of career paths open to lawyers, probably the most of any degree you can do. Um, for example, if you decide that you want to study English, it is very difficult to subsequently become an engineer. Um, however, if you are a lawyer, the opportunities to go and work in almost any kind of company are there for you because pretty much every company needs lawyers. Um, even the mafia has lawyers. Everyone needs them. Um, and that goes for whether you decide to work in the private sector or in the public sector. Um, there are huge opportunities in the civil service for lawyers, um, as well as going into teaching. So law is a really good option if you're not sure what you want to do after you graduate. Um, but you want to get a really good degree. Um, as we just mentioned, my friend who is a corporate litigation barrister and has been making six figures since she was 26. Uh, upsetting, um, for me at least, I, I don't earn that much. Um, you can earn a, a phenomenal amount of money um, as a lawyer. Um, you can also, if you choose, not earn very much money. My friend is a corporate litigation barrister, she makes lots of money. Um, you can also become a human rights barrister or a criminal barrister. Um, and in these instances, you won't make all that much money at all, as criminals, for the most part, don't have very much money. Uh, human rights, also not very much money in it. Um, and there are other areas of law that you can go into that um, are not as well remunerated as others. Um, Will talked a little bit about the, um, the incredible working hours. Now, I, I don't know if your parents are both barristers, Will, or whether they're... Um, Yes, um, one's a family law QC and the other's a clinical negligence barrister. Well, there you go. Um, of course, if they wanted um, if they wanted quieter lives, they could have become conveyancing solicitors or something else that's um, more of a nine to five. Mm. Uh, so there's a whole range of options in the um, in the legal profession. It's not all as not all as um, intensive as being a QC. Um, and the other thing is that you can you can get a lot of social prestige from being a lawyer. Um, people trust lawyers, 
Um, lawyers are allowed to sign all kinds of documents. There Passports. are, yeah, you can sign for a passport if you're a lawyer. Um, uh, people will take you seriously. You can go on to become a judge. There are all sorts of things you can do um, in terms of people respecting you and taking you seriously. Um, alongside doctors, doctors and lawyers, those are the two jobs that um, parents dream of their children taking up. Um, Rohan isn't here today, but I'm sure if we asked him what his parents' second choice after doctor would have been, he would say lawyer. Um, I haven't checked with Rohan's mum, actually. I should have texted her before this uh, to ask how disappointed she'd have been if he became a lawyer. Um, and if that's the thing he would have been, she would have been least disappointed by, then we have the answer there. Um, so hopefully we've sort of sold you on law. Um, so applying for law. Um, one of the nice things about law is that you can go into it with almost any set of A-levels. Um, you want to have an essay subject in there. Um, history or English are the traditional choices. Um, but there's nothing wrong with if you've um, done maths or biology or chemistry. Um, all of these A-levels can take you into law. Um, in my experience, the best um, law students I've worked with have been the ones who are doing history and maths. Um, and so they've got a really broad range of experience they're bringing to um, what they're doing. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there are a lot of careers you can take as a lawyer. So it's really valuable to find some relevant work experience. Um, as Will mentions, it's a lot of work being a barrister. If you can find that out when you're 19, rather than when you're 23, that's going to save you a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, so work experience is really valuable there. As ever, as I always say, it's really much more effective to discover you don't want to be married before you get married. The easiest time to divorce is before you're married. If you don't want to do a job, try and find out before you do a degree in the job. Um, now, you've also got the LNAT with law, so we'll talk about that in a little more detail. So the top universities, they have a test for law. It's called the LNAT, uh, the Law National Admissions Test. Um, it's relatively tricky, um, and so it really pays off to prepare early for it, because the LNAT, and if this leads into what we were talking about with A-levels, really is um, a test of skills, not a test of knowledge, and this goes for law in general. Um, if you show up to law school knowing nothing about the law at all, that will be fine as long as you have the critical and reasoning skills. Um, if you show up knowing, knowing loads of stuff, um, but not having those skills, you're going to find it really difficult and it's not going to work for you. Um, and that's why preparing for the LNAT in advance is really valuable because you can make a real difference to your score there. And it's a really big part of um, how particularly Oxford uh, will assess you. Um, speaking of how things are assessed, Will, I'm going to throw over to you to um, talk us through the pie chart. Uh, while I uh, go and find out what that um, uh, delivery noise um, that's just come to my door was. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so we usually talk about this each week, um, and that's because it's important for people who, you know, this the, the first or only open day that you're planning on coming to, it's quite an important takeaway to have. Um, because there's often a lot of misunderstanding as to what is the most important thing in your application. Um, and this should hopefully demystify things a little bit. And, and actually, this, this is, is dynamic too. So this has changed recently. Um, and I'll explain what, about what's changed. When it comes to an Oxbridge application, um, there are generally three very key things uh, which they are looking at. Your academic record so far, so your GCSEs, uh, your predicted grades, your A-levels, if you have them, um, any any uh, academic uh, portfolio you have so far, um, your admissions test score, so that is at the LNAT uh, or the CLT, if you're a Cambridge applicant, uh, and the interview, um, that's understandably very, very important to them. That little yellow section which says everything else, that comprises of your personal statement, your uh, reference letters, often written by your school, um, and any other kind of intangible benefits that don't slot into interview uh, or, or academics nice, uh, easily. Um, when it comes to Oxford and Cambridge, those do have to be relevant. So being grade eight piano, sadly, is not a benefit to your application. Uh, if, if anything, it's gonna take up time that you should be spending elsewhere. Um, but as you can see, the admissions test score and the interview, they take up the majority of this decision. Um, they, they are enormously influential. Very often people think it's all to do with your grades and your personal statement, but that's only a small segment. 
um, and actually exam grades that they used to be, they used to take up a slightly bigger chunk in this, but as uh, exams have been sat less and less these last couple of years, we've seen a shift towards waiting on the uh, on, on the admissions test and the interviews. Um, so this is very, very important information to have when you're thinking about your application. But what, what, what do you do with it? Well, the key thing to do with it is to help it, let it inform how you prepare. So if you're setting yourself aside time every week to work on your application, if 90% of that time is spent on the personal statement, then you're doing it wrong, okay? You wanna make sure that you're spending your time where it, can, where it is gonna make the most difference, all right? Now, obviously, once your LNAT is at 100%, once your CLT essays are perfect, then you can start, you know, you can shift a bit more time to the personal statement. But every bonus you can make, every incremental bonus you can make in the test or in your interview performance is going to far outweigh any incremental improvement in the personal statement. Doesn't mean we neglect the personal statement because you want your application to be as strong as possible across everything. But you, you should never be spending the majority of your time on your statement. You should be spending more time on the test and the interviews and developing skills relevant to both of those. Okay. This does vary from subject to subject. Um, now, this is pretty good for law. Um, and it's also going to vary from university to university. So if you're thinking of non-Oxbridge law, then actually grade eight piano might make a bit of a difference. Um, Oxbridge are pretty fiercely academic, so it's, it's, it's not going to bother them. Um, but also if, if you were, let's say you weren't interested in law, you're interested in maths, the personal statement is going to become even less important. The test is going to become more important. Um, so those are the kind of things that, that uh, get juggled around. But again, this is a very good uh, representation for law, but a pretty good rule of thumb for most subjects across Oxford and Cambridge. Okay. Um, uh, we'll briefly allude there to the CLT, the Cambridge Law Test. Uh, we're going to come on to talk about tests in a moment. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind that, um, I'm just going to fact check myself here, um, it's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there are only 10 universities in the UK where there'll be a test um, for applying for law. Um, and so um, as with applying for medicine, it's a good idea to get a balance of um, LNAT, non-LNAT universities uh, when you come to apply to make sure that you've got a a backup option if the LMAT doesn't go brilliantly for you. Um, although there are some subtleties there that I'm going to come on to talk about in a second. Um, so let's do that. Um, you'll see I put in a pun. Uh, I'm calling this next section a making a case for yourself, like a lawyer would have a case. It's very clever. Um, so the LMAT, how does the LMAT work? Um, the LMAT is 42 uh, verbal reasoning. Um, I've abbreviated this here, MCQ5. Um, this is jargon from inside our organization, which is to say they are multiple choice questions and there are five possible answers um, to each of the questions, um, which I abbreviate to an MCQ5. Um, you have 42 of these questions and they're based on 12 passages um, and you have 95 minutes uh, to work through them. Um, these passages tend to be pretty long. Um, Will's gonna help us work through a, a condensed example in a moment. Um, but they're normally 300 words or so. So you're reading quite a lot of text in 90, 95 minutes plus answering quite a lot of questions. So it, it's pretty time pressured, the LNAT, um, which people don't always realize. Um, after you've come through that, you then get to the essay section. Uh, you write one essay, they give you three topics to choose from, and you have 40 minutes. Um, the thing to remember here is you've already been doing this exam for an hour and a half, and it's pretty intensive. So you wanna make sure you hold back some stamina for the uh, essay. Again, this is where it becomes really useful to have prepared well in advance and done timed, uh, timed mocks so that you really, really haven't worn your hand out. Um, or I suppose it's on computers these days, isn't it, the LNAT? I think it gets administered through Pearson, so maybe you don't have to worry about that. Wear out your fingers. Um, now, Cambridge, they don't use the LNAT. Why is an enormous mystery. Um, they have uh, its own, their own test called the Cambridge Law Test. And this is basically the same format as the essay section of the LNAT, except I believe you're given an hour rather than 40 minutes. Um, and that's it, just an essay. That's all there is to it. Um, and that then gets marked by the college that you apply to rather than being uh, centrally marked like the LNAT. 
Um, now, as we mentioned earlier, there are loads of really good universities that don't use the LNAT. There are only 10 that do. Um, so if you're thinking about your five choices and you're thinking, well, I'm going to apply to Oxford, um, I'm going to get a good LNAT score, so I'm going to apply to Bristol and UCL as well. Um, you'll want to put a couple of non-LNAT universities in there, uh, Warwick, Southampton, uh, Leeds, uh, which is coming up a lot today, um, to sort of round it out, so to be, to be on the safe side, um, so that if your LNAT score is disappointing, it's not going to prejudice you uh, with everyone. Um, the LNAT is a little bit odd here as well, which is that if you're not applying to Oxbridge, you can do the LNAT before you decide where you're going to apply. Now, I don't know um, whether you can get how quick, quickly and easily you can get the scores, um, whether this is like the UCAT where you can get the score before you um, apply. This is something I'll have to double check. Um, so I'll do that during the Q&A. Um, but you can um, choose to take the LNAT all the way through until January. Um, but obviously not if you're applying to Oxford or Cambridge when you'll have to do it um, earlier. Uh, Will, do you, do you know if they give you the LNAT score um, before, the, um, before the results deadline? For an uh, Oxford applicant, certainly no. Um, for a non-Oxbridge applicant, I, I think it's the same. Like, I don't think you'd know your LNAT before you make your, your LNAT score before you make the application. Yeah. Okay. My uh, my background is more Oxford based. Well, I'll have to I'll have I'll have to I'll have to look into this. Um, having a quick look on the LNAT consortium um, guidelines, and it does say that they will know your score before you do. So maybe you can't pull off that trick. Um, but that's something we'll ask Ben about actually, because he'll know. He's the expert. Um, so uh, we're now going to do a test LNAT question. Um, this is one I've pulled out for Will. Uh, this is from um, our book, The Ultimate LNAT Guide, um, that you can uh, buy on Amazon. Um, and all of our books, and goodness me, there's a lot of them, um, are included with any program that you might book with us. Um, so this is a, a question from that. Uh, from that. So this is roughly um, a third of the passage. Um, normally the passage will be about three times this length, um, but I've exerted a shorter passage for Will um, so that he can uh, attempt it. Um, uh, yeah, so... Um, while, it, while, it, while it fits on the screen. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, you'll see from, I'm sure people are sort of reading through this as I'm talking, you'll see from this question example that actually what Matt was saying about having prior knowledge isn't really required. Um, then they're not expecting you to know about the placebo. They don't care if you know about this study. Um, because they give you the information there. It's all about how you interpret the information that's there. Um, and of course, that, that's a skill that you can develop. And uh, one skill is in being able to interpret the, the information that's there. Another skill is in being able to address the test. Okay, so very often with uh, multiple choice uh, solutions, it, it's helpful to cross off uh, answers which are just, that they're not possible at all. Very often there's two answers which are very close to each other and there's a nuanced difference between what they mean and that can catch people out. And there's usually some which are which are clearly wrong. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so obviously this is talking about, uh, I suppose, some kind of uh, research where they're testing um, uh, medical treatment on a group and having a placebo control. Um, now, what, one issue that I have with this question is there's no sort of uh, statistical analysis, so we don't know the significance of the results, and given that the sample size are very small, that is a problem with the study. Um, but actually, you know, ignoring that for a second, we've got a difference in the uh, experimental group uh, that we that compared to the control group. If we go through the answers, uh, we can very easily chuck out some rubbish ones. So D, the beneficial effects of homeopathy are experienced only by animals. There's nothing to, to say that that's the case um, in, in this passage, so we can ignore that one right away. Um, we can also ignore um, the beneficial effects of homeopathy are entirely due to the placebo effect, because we've, we've seen here the whole point of this study and the findings is that this happened specifically to a group when controlling for the placebo. So we can ignore that. Now, if you look at E, the beneficial effects of homeopathy are subject to a great deal of ill-informed criticism. Um, 
you you could say that so it does seem obviously the the premise is it's being uh refuted for being a placebo but this uh this study sort of suggests that it's not um but it's a bit of a it's a bit of a stretch um and sort of you, you'd need to know um you'd need to know more um based on than what's just here um, B, we've got that the beneficial effects of homeopathy are apparent and not genuine. Again, so there seems to be, at least what this passage is supporting, is that there is an apparent benefit. Uh, uh, there is a genuine, sorry, benefit of homeopathy, uh, which leaves us with C. Uh, the beneficial effects of homeopathy in cows cannot be due to the placebo effect, which is, uh, statistical uh, analysis aside, what, what these findings seem to suggest. Um, and of course, you, you might be drawn to E, um, but actually, that's probably not supported nearly as sufficiently as C is, but based on this information alone. Okay. Again, you know, it, it's it's you don't have to have known. You're not going to come into this test and think, oh gosh, I don't know about the placebo. I'm not going to be able to get this one right. You can work it out if you if you've developed the skills and practice that. Fab. Thanks, Will. You'll be pleased to know that the answer is indeed C. Um, so well done. Uh, you have passed you. The, the LNAP test. Um, as Will said, there are there are a lot of red herrings you find in this kind of question. Um, you will expect that you need to know about homeopathy, about the placebo effect, about uh, the kind of cows that you have in this particular part of um, northern Holland. Uh, no, N none of this information is relevant. In fact, um, one of the ways they'll catch you out in verbal reasoning questions of this type is that they will give you um, a subject that you already know about um, and so you will um, over conclude by remember by using your own knowledge rather than the information in the text um, so you've got to you've got to watch out for that um, so we're now going to talk um, about the next section of the LNAT, the essay um, so afterward after the uh, reasoning questions you'll have an essay um, these are on very broad legal and ethical topics they will not ask you um, a really specific question about some question of constitutional law or um, a detailed individual case. It'll be very broad strokes questions. Because um, again, this isn't about having legal knowledge. This is about making a good, clear, coherent argument. Um, again, skills, not knowledge. So the, the example that um, I've pulled, this is from the um, Cambridge Law Test. Uh, it's one of their sample questions they provide. Um, they ask, should a drug dealer ever be punished for the death of someone who overdoses on drugs that she has supplied? Um, so issues you might explore here, you might talk about the um, question of consequences. You know, overdosing, is that something that is on the dealer or is that on the user? Um, what if the drugs have been contaminated? What if they've been contaminated on purpose? What about by accident? Um, are the problems that a drug dealer would experience with the law sufficient already? Um, why doesn't isn't deterrence working? Uh, Will, where, where do you stand on the drug dealer? So, yeah, I, I suppose it's sort of linked. Your opinion is going to be linked to your politics in terms of um, sort of the like personal freedoms. Um, my, uh, you know, not going into it in too much detail, but I, I would say that it's the individual's choice and right to seek out drugs. And they've obviously done that with the understanding that there's a risk associated um, and without purposeful lacing of the drugs then it, it's sort of the drug dealer themselves whilst they could be persecuted for dealing drugs which is illegal um, the sort of the subsequent consequences of that um, I don't think currently um, are uh, sort of punishable but Ben might correct me on that later yeah uh, one thing that occurs to me here is that obviously it's possible to overdose on almost any drug, including the kind you get from a pharmacy or over the counter in a supermarket. And so we might contrast this question with a question, um, should a doctor uh, ever be punished for the death of someone who overdoses on prescription drugs that they have supplied? Now, it would seem ludicrous um, for the doctor to be prosecuted for someone overdosing on paracetamol. Um, so is it logical for us to uh, pass on a kind of exaggerated duty of care onto drug dealers that we don't pass on to doctors um, or does the criminality of drugs make this more complex again this is a big picture question that doesn't require you to know anything beyond what drugs are and what drug dealers are i guess what death is um 
this is about showing your capacity to reason, to put forward a logical argument, um, to combat um, anticipated counter arguments, not about you having a detailed knowledge of uh, the relevant drug legislation. Um, that brings us on to think about the interview, because you've done the test, you've done marvelously. Um, the three criteria that um, uh, this is from the Oxford Admissions Manual they highlight when talking about interviews is uh, they want to see application, and they want to see that you can concentrate, that you can really get into a problem. They want to see that you can uh, reason your way through it, put together an argument that is clear and serious. And if you end up down a kind of blind alley or digging yourself into a hole that you can get out of it. Um, and they want all of this to be articulated in a clear and careful and articulate way. Um, Will, do you have anything to add on, on interviews before we move on to conversion courses? Um, just a general point that I often make about wider reading, and people have probably heard this before, um, that very often sort of reading as many books as possible is seen as like an objective um, and seen as like a, a tick box for the, for the Oxbridge admissions tutors, which it's not really. Um, wider reading isn't really the main goal. It's more a side effect of you being the right kind of applicant. So if you're very interested in your subject and you're very academically driven and you're very academically curious, you're gonna be reading around your subject. Um, and you're also gonna be reading quite thoughtfully, um, you know, having your own opinions, writing notes about what you've read, um, maybe sort of disagreeing with what you've read. And that's something which is, is gonna come across quite well in the interview just blasting through as many books as you can is often something that I see, and it's really not going to help. Um, you know, they're, they're not gonna be sat there thinking, well, this interview hasn't gone very well, but he has read 10 books on law, so he's probably qualified. That, that's not what they're interested in. The fact that you've read 10 books on law should come across in the interview naturally. Um, but more than that, you should be interacting with these books on a, on a thoughtful level, rather than just seeing them as, a, as an objective to, or a tick box to complete. Um, and I suppose, you know, that that is associated with the application there, and they want to see your interaction with the text that you've been engaging with. They, they don't want to just hear you regurgitate, you know, I read X, it said this. Um, they want to see that you've engaged with it on, on a thoughtful level. Fab. Uh, thanks, Will. Um, we've dealt with interviews quite briefly here. Um, there's a good reason for this, which is that the interviews are in November and December, and it's presently February. Um, if you stick with us through to interview season, <laughs> um, we'll be dealing with all of this in much more detail. Um, but we're really trying to give people a broad overview as they're planning out their UCAS application in the early stages at the moment. Um, so the last thing to talk about is conversion courses. Um, a lot of people, including me, um, uh, consider becoming lawyers uh, after they finish their degree and discover that your uh, even your first in comparative literature uh, doesn't lead to an obvious job. Um, now, you have the option at this point to go and become a lawyer uh, through what's called a conversion course. Now, um, these conversion courses are very popular, um, as I say, among students who've done a, a useless humanities uh, degree and want to go and do something proper afterwards. Um, and the nice thing about these is that the university you choose for the conversion, uh, which is called the GDL, the Graduate Diploma in Law, um, is much less important than where you went for your undergrad. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my, my close personal friend who is a um, commercial litigation barrister, um, she also sits on the Bar Council. Um, and the official view of the Bar Council is, we don't care where you do your GDL, whatever. Um, so you can go to the University of Law in London, you can go to the University of Bournemouth in Bournemouth, um, all of them are fine. Um, you still end up a lawyer at the end of it. Now, if you've done the GDL or you've already done that law degree, um, often you'll need to go and do a secondary qualification. Um, this is an area where Ben is gonna be able to help us out in a moment. Um, if you want to be a solicitor, you're gonna to have to go and do the solicitor's course. If you want to be a barrister, you have to sit the bar exam. Um, doing a law degree is a good start, um, but for many legal professions, there's a subsequent professional qualification you want to follow on with. Um, so if you're thinking you can get it all done in three years, unfortunately, the bad news is it could be four or five. Um, but again, that's that's where Ben's the expert. Um, so that brings us on to the um, what we can do, the bit where uh, Will lays out how we can help. Will, how can we help uh, get you to be a lawyer? It's a very good question, Matt. Thank you for asking. 
Um, so look, obviously we've been talking about all the different things that matter in the application process, all the different things that Oxford and Cambridge are going to be assessing you on. But but also, you know, if it's not Oxbridge, maybe uh, Durham Law, they're, they're still going to have the LNAT, so that's still a part that you're being assessed on. Um, generally speaking, our approach is to tailor our support to the individuals that come our way. Uh, different students require different things based on their circumstances and their scenario. Um, so the first thing to say is there's sort of a, a process that we do um, where uh, we want to speak with all our students first, really understand them, understand where they're coming from, um, and we'll be able to design the most suitable program. But broadly speaking, they normally consist of four, four key parts. Um, and I can't remember which part these slides start with. Matt, can you click onto the next? Okay, yeah, resources. So um, the four key parts are tutorials, uh, resources, weekly seminars, and intensive courses. And I'll just spend a bit of time explaining each one briefly. Um, so naturally, something like the LNAP requires a lot of practice. Yes, you'll have a tutor to support you with it, but actually a tutor is not a substitute for hard work. Um, and you are going to have to be working uh, a lot on doing practice essays, practicing those, uh, you know, the, the responses to those passages. So we design textbooks for the LNAP. We've got an online preparation platform for it. We do, um, you know, uh, essay marking for the LNAP and for the CLT all outside of the tutorial. So you can be working away on everything. Uh, at the same time, there are books for the personal statement, book for the interviews, book about, there's a book about choosing your colleges within Oxford or Cambridge. So pretty much every step of the way, you're going to have something to refer to, to use and to guide you in this process. Um, and yeah, the, the preparation portal is something very specific to the test. I think, do we still have a, uh, a clip of that? Right? We have a clip. The bad news is um, I haven't re-edited the clip, so it does okay. show you how to do math. Oh, quick clip. Um, but as we, oh, I say those of you who heard last week will know the clip is very quick. Uh, so, Will, hopefully you've practiced. I'll, I'll speak double time. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the portal is sort of split into three main bits. The first um, is what we call learn. And I suppose that's, you know, going through the content, going through the nature of the questions, what the questions are expecting. Um, this is obviously an example from someone who's preparing for maybe the NSAA or the PAT. Uh, but for the LNAT, um, obviously there'd be lots of things for you to learn um, about the specific skills, less so the content. Um, it's uh, It doesn't seem to be moving, Matt, or am I just speaking so quickly now? Oh, I. No, I think I, I think I've kicked it going again. <laughs> okay, okay. So yes, so here's an example for um, for the, the our, our math students. Um, and obviously that's a really good starting point. Uh, you, you don't want to run before you can walk. Um, and before you start running yourself through lots of practice questions, you want to make sure you've got a good understanding of what's going on. But once you've done that, then the practice questions come in thick and fast. Um, and, um, you know, there's, and that's in the revised section. It's, 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 yes. Yeah, so, so here's some more examples. This, this video isn't working as nicely as it did last week. How annoying. No. Um, but yeah, and, and obviously it's quite helpful doing it virtually because you've got a good track of how you're doing and how you're improving, um, as well as a little timer up there so you know if you're taking too long or if, if, if time is something that you need to work on. Um, so you do lots of practice questions, and then once you're, you know, got a really firm understanding of everything, you then start doing some full papers. Um, got lots of past papers as well as specimen papers um, for you to work through. Um, and of course, this is the best way to assess how well you are doing in a full test scenario. Uh, and you'll be working with this through the year, improving, um, you know, working on uh, getting better at both sections of the test. But also, you know, when there are things, obviously when there are subtle things, easy things to work on, you can. But when there are more difficult things, more conceptual things that you're struggling with in the test, then of course you've got your tutor to turn to who can help you learn and understand where you're going wrong. Uh, which hopefully brings us through to the next slide. It can do. But it doesn't. So actually, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, sorry. So, um, this is the other part, our enrichment seminars. 
Um, so, so these run pretty much every Sunday afternoon. There'll be about 75 to 90 minutes, depending on discussion and, uh, and questions. Uh, but they cover a very broad range of uh, topics at, at the university level on law. So uh, anyone worried that they might have to go to seminars for students of other subjects, you won't. Uh, then there are five streams that we run concurrently on a Sunday afternoon. One for medicine, one for STEM, one for humanities, one for economics, and one for law. Um, now, we said that with the LNAP, they're not really looking for prior knowledge. So you going to these seminars uh, isn't really going to make an enormous difference to uh, your LNAP, um, because you'll be learning about lots of different things in law. You'll be delving deeply into specific areas that you're interested in. Um, but this is really, really relevant to personal statement and the interviews. Firstly, are in terms of you know, being able to demonstrate to them that you are engaged with your topic, helping you explore law is, is so important, but also getting into that academic environment on a weekly basis, discussing advanced topics, posing questions, uh, maybe posing some bad questions to start with, but eventually getting the sense for what is a good question, how to explore things more, it means that by the end of the year, you'll come to that interview, you know, very comfortable in a very natural scenario for you. Um, and yeah, th th there's a huge range of topics. Not all of them will be on areas that you are interested in, but the point is for the ones that you are interested in, you can delve into those much you know, deeper and deeper uh, and as much as you want. And when we give reading uh, suggestions for each, for each seminar topic. Uh, uh, thanks, Will. Um, that brings us on to the uh, question of the day courses. Um, so if you um, do choose yeah. to join us on one of our programs, um, one of the things that we offer is um, at the moment they're online, but I, I remain hopeful we'll get to, you know, be in the physical world of one another again soon. Onto the day courses we offer. Um, these are um, exclusive to our program customers, and that's a full weekend um, at the moment of um, uh, preparation. Well, we've we both worked on these. Um, how did you you enjoy administering them? Yeah, so they were fun to do when it was in person. Um, and there were obviously some difficulties doing things online compared to um, doing them in person. So Matt was talking about doing a full weekend. We, we do that for the interviews intensive course, um, because actually when you've got different students needing to go to different things, it does take a little longer when they're all at home and you've got to try and cajole them into different uh, meeting rooms. Um, but yeah, look, it, these are there, but obviously as an individual, you're going to be working through the resources, working with your tutor, working in the enrichment seminar gradually through the year. These are there to really round off your preparation, to consolidate all the work you've been doing. You know, you go to an intensive course at the LNAP just a few weeks before the real thing. So you can see how everyone else is doing, you can learn from their experiences and you can learn with them on the day. You can address every part of the test and make sure that you're happy and confident. Uh, and you can walk into it a couple of weeks later, knowing that you are prepared, knowing that you've done everything you're supposed to be doing. Um, if you go to the course and you come out of it thinking, actually, you know, I found a couple of those passages pretty, uh, pretty dense, pretty tricky to read through. Um, that's not quite where I want it to be. You've got those last few weeks to iron out any any final creases that are that are sticking out. Yeah. Um, we also provide one-to-one uh, -one tuition. Um, so for all of the advantages of these resources, um, we will match you with a tutor who is um, studying the subject um, at the university that you're planning to attend. Um, they'll be able to give you that um, personal attention, really uh, focus on the areas that you're weak in, amplify the areas that you're strong. Um, and you'll also be able to have a, a set of interviews with um, different tutors so that you can really experience the um, experience, what the interview is going to be like ahead of time. Um, which I think is in many respects that the most valuable thing, it's certainly what I fell down on in my application to Oxford. Um, now, we also make sure that um, all of this is reported. So those of you who are parents who are joining us today, um, you receive a PDF um, lesson report after every um, every lesson, laying out what your um, child has been working on, where they've done well, where they've done uh, less well, what areas that you can support them in, um, and just making sure that you know um, what they're up to. As, as, as I know um, from my experience of teenagers, 
And if you ask them how things were, they go, mm, fine. And that's it. Uh, so you've got a lovely PDF, uh, which says more than mm, fine in it, which can be really helpful. Um, so, Will, uh, does it work? Does all of this work? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're finding out, I don't know where things are on the research for this last round of uh, entrance, but, but we last are, we're gathering data. I'm hoping to have it in a few weeks time. Uh, so stay yeah, tuned. OK, OK. So, so last year, um, generally speaking, we were pretty happy with uh, the number of our students that got offers. Um, this year, hopefully, it, it's looking the same. Um, naturally, you know, there's there's no, it, it's this, it's not a sure thing. It does require the student to put in a lot of work, um, and there will be students that I say, actually, I'm not convinced that this is right for you because it's going to take a lot more work than you're ready to commit to this. But if you are ready to work hard, um, if you've got the academic potential, um, then, you know, it, it's certainly well within your grasp, provided that you've got the right tools. Uh, and naturally, our, our program is, is what we see as the right tools for something like an Oxbridge application. So, yeah, it, it worked pretty well last year. Um, we'll see what happens this year. One thing to bear in mind is this is, of course, an average. So students that start early consistently outperform the students that start late. So those that start at the start of the year, um, first three months, th their success rate is sort of a few percentage points higher up. And then those that start much later are a few percentage points lower down. Wow. Um, the other thing to, to say is that 18%, um, that's a, a national average. Um, we also perform pretty darn well when it comes to the um, uh, the big schools, uh, you may have heard of some of these. Uh, Eton College, a famous school. Um, we do better than them. We do better than Hills Road, which is, um, I used to live across the road from there, actually. Um, nice school, lovely, um, lovely playing fields. Uh, we do better than them. We do better than all of the um, top schools that are putting in the most applications. Um, this data is from Oxford, but um, the information from Cambridge is, is much the same in terms of results. Mm -hmm. um, and this is because um, obviously these schools do a marvelous job, um, but we do, um, we put an enormous amount of effort and time and research into what we're doing. Um, and we like to think that um, while Eton obviously is, is marvelous, you know, lots to be said, to be said for it. Um, they're trying to do a whole bunch of things, maths, English, plays, rugby, um, whereas this is the only thing we're doing. And we like to think that, that focus um, really pays off. Um, we also get it done um, through the same medium as, um, as Eaton, um, although at much lower cost, um, as probably will come up later. Um, we are also selective. Um, we get a lot of calls from students, um, but we are we have a specific approach. In fact, Will, you, you speak to more students than I do, so you can, you can talk us through briefly uh, how we pick. Yeah, so like I said, we're not gonna take on a student in a program before I or one of my team has spoken with them. Uh, and what we're looking for are a few things in particular. Obviously, we want them to have a good academic record so far. But if you remember from the pie chart, it's only about a quarter of the decision whether or not they're going to accept you. Um, so, so it's not the most important thing. And actually, we have a lot of success with students who have below average GCSEs, even students who have been told by their school not to apply because their GCSEs aren't high enough. Uh, because we're able to work on that remaining 75%. And naturally, that's going to make a much bigger influence. On the flip side, you know, I speak to students with straight nines, straight A star predictions, but they're not, you know, th th their drive, their attitude is, is not right. They're not willing to work hard. They're not going to put in the effort that's required. And yes, that first 25%, that's secured. But actually, that's a, that's very small in comparison to the to the rest of what's there. And if you're not going to put in the effort for the test, if you're just going to sort of try and wing it, if you're going to try and wing the interviews, then it's never going to work. And that's not the kind of student that we want to support. Um, so yeah, obviously grades do matter. If, if your grades are so low that they're prohibitive to actually getting an offer, then I don't want to waste someone's time and give them false hope. But they're not the most important thing. 
I'm much more keen on supporting hardworking students who are very interested in the subject and very keen to do very well. Fab, thank you. Um, the, uh, the thing to remember here is we, we speak to a lot of students who are um, convinced they're going to get in, um, go into the interview, uh, they take the attitude that, you know, I guess I could come to Oxford if you, if you guys really impress me. You know, these universities are looking for people who are uh, looking to be taught, not looking to teach. Um, and we take that same attitude with the, the students we work with. Um, that level of commitment Will talked about. Um, we try to um, reflect this to what we call our student honor code, um, which means that we make students accountable for their own learning. Um, we need to make sure that they take, make the resource it, the best of all the resources we provide for them. Um, and so that they, you know, treat their tutors with respect so they can focus on the teaching, not chasing them up via, via WhatsApp or email to make sure they show up to the lessons. Um, again, this is all part of our process of uh, picking people on the basis of attitude, not aptitude. Um, you might be smart enough to do it without us. Um, you might feel that you're not smart enough to do it at all. Um, but if you've got the right attitude, that's what we want to work with, not with people who um, think they've already, they already know everything. Um, it doesn't tend to pay off for them. Um, our tutors don't like working with them. Um, and if that's if that's the you know the attitude you bring into this, then that's fine. Um, probably won't be for us, and you, we won't be for you. Um, now, people have lovely things to say about us on Trustpilot. Um, I'm not going to keep these up for the full reading duration, uh, both because we're running a little late, and also um, because they're very long. Um, but if you want to read people saying nice things about us, please do visit Trustpilot. Um, and if you have something nice to say about these webinars, that's the, the best place to tell us as well. Um, just to sort of round off on um, these questions of our programmes, um, we are really pleased to offer a two week trial. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we are a little selective um, and we understand that you as parents and students are selective too. Um, if you uh, come and join us those first two weeks, if it turns out it doesn't work, if you don't like us, um, if there isn't a good fit, um, then we're more than happy to walk away um, and give you a full refund. Um, this is part of ensuring that we have a good match between the parent, the student, the tutor, the programme, the whole thing. Um, we don't want to work with students who don't want to work with us. We don't want to force anyone to do anything. Um, if you don't want to be a lawyer, uh, we don't want to spend a year trying to force you because your mum thinks you should be. Um, that's happened to a friend of mine. Um, we want to give you that peace of mind, and that's what the two-week trial is all about. Um, now, probably you'll have more detailed questions um, about your personal circumstances. Now, we're going to answer a bunch of those in the Q&A, uh, so please do drop your uh, questions into the Q&A panel. Um, but if you want one-to-one -one attention of the kind that we cannot offer uh, in the webinar format, um, please uh, get in touch with us by booking a consultation. Uh, this little animation should be showing you how it's done. Um, at this very moment um, and you can do that um, right now or indeed later to um, get in touch with us and book a consultation with Will or Dylan or Will too. Um, <laughs> a, a whole selection of our expert consultants will be able to help you out. Fab, so that, that brings us to the Q&A. So I'm going to um, introduce Ben. Uh, ben is our, is our guest, our honoured guest today. Uh, but Ben, beyond honoured guest, who are you? Why are you here? Okay, good question. Why am I here? Just shorten that to why, can't we? Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, my name is Ben. Uh, I, I studied law at Oxford from 2014 to 2018. Uh, otherwise, I have tutored now for about six years. I've worked for the University of Oxford um, in admissions and access work specifically. Um, in terms of my CV, uh, I have spent a lot of time on this kind of work. Um, part of that, I've been working with um, Uni Admissions now for a good while, uh, about a year and a half, um, working with students as their personal tutor, but also um, delivering a variety of different uh, panel events, um, lectures, all sorts of bits and bobs. Um, so uh, that is why I am here. I will also apologise for the fact that I desperately need a haircut. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I'm suffering from the same problem. This is, this is the longest my hair has been in some time, uh, which may not look much to the rest of you, 
uh, but it's this thin, it having grown all the way up to a number four, uh, it, it doesn't look great uh, up close. Uh, certainly not from the side, which has been a problem. Um, so we've got a few questions coming in already. Um, so uh, Gajendra Reddy asks, how can we help um, Scottish students in particular? Um, because obviously they have different laws up there, uh, Scots law. Um, so Will, um, do we have any, I'm sure we have experience with getting people into Edinburgh and Ad Aberdeen and all those sorts of places, Glasgow. Um, could you offer some thoughts there? Um, and Ben, if you can uh, chip in on what's, uh, what Scots law is. Um, I only know, my, the only thing I know about it is they have a third outcome uh, in trials, which is exciting. Uh, but Will, if you could start us off. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, naturally, a uh, couple of the uh, Scottish universities require the LNAT. Um, so we often have a few students each year who are making applications that way. Um, and, uh, you know, generally speaking, they, they approach the LNAT quite similarly to how uh, other students do too. Um, so other other universities do too sorry so, so obviously the, the approach is the same have a fair well for the LNAT have a fantastic score um, you know impress them with your personal statement unlikely to have an interview uh, so there isn't that side of things but absolutely the other the parts of the application which are required we, we can certainly help you with yeah um, I suppose in terms of what's been said especially by Matt um, I think the big thing to flag with the way that legal systems work in England and Wales slash Scotland and also slash Northern Ireland is we have an English and Welsh legal system. Then we have a separate Scottish one, which means if you want to practice law and do a qualifying law degree as part of your route to qualification, you will need to do an English or Welsh LLB. Whereas if you want to practice in Scotland, you'll need to do one up in Scotland. That said, uh, the route to qualification uh, mentioned briefly before, but you, you can still convert. So even if you did do your degree in Scotland and then decided that you wanted to practice in England and Wales, you can qualify to become somebody who practices in uh, England and Wales. So it's not too much of a concern. Um, otherwise, uh, Scottish heritage means I back it, do it. <laughs> Yes, as a, as a little nuance on this, Ben, can can you tell us what not pr um, how not proven works? Because I've always been intrigued by this. Right. Okay. Um, Got to be honest. My legal training is in the English and Welsh system. Um, my knowledge of this is coming from a program that I watched with David Tennant in it. Um, however, <laughs> um, my understanding of that is essentially you can have um, um, not guilty or an acquitted. So that is where there is proof. There is clear evidence that you have not committed that crime. Um, guilty, well, we all know what that means. Um, and then the, the not proven is essentially a situation where they cannot and will not send you to prison because they haven't got enough evidence. Um, however, they're also not willing to say that you are fully acquitted because they do not have the evidence to say that you did not do it. So that is limited amount of knowledge I have on that. So there you go. Um, if you're thinking of doing a crime in Scotland, the bad news is the options are he done it, he didn't do it, and he probably done it, but we can't prove it. So, you know, make sure you cover your tracks well if you're doing any crimes in Scotland. Um, fab. Uh, da -da -da -da. Um, Angelina Ang asks, um, for applications to Oxbridge, is it important to have a strong CV? Is it necessary to engage in many extra extracurricular, extracurricular activities? Um, or can I just focus on my academics? Um, well, I know you've got the official answer and then hopefully Ben can um, fill in with his personal experience here and, and your personal experience too, Will. Um, yeah, so generally speaking, uh, the, the personal statements and well, so let's talk about extracurriculars first. Um, any extracurriculars which aren't relevant to what you're hoping to study uh, pretty much have no impact on the decision. So, so I was talking earlier about piano, but uh, you know, if you could do D of V, you could do drama qualifications, all these things would give you uh, UCAS points, but they're not actually going to influence an Oxbridge professor to think, oh, actually, we should take them on instead of this one who did better at the LNAT. Um, there are much more important criteria that Oxford and Cambridge have that perhaps other universities don't. 
because they have this application process and because they're able to gather more about you. Um, generally speaking, your uh, and again, Ben will, will speak otherwise, I'm sure, but generally speaking, academics are much more important to them. Um, obviously, if you have a placement or anything like that in a law firm, that's great. And that's really good personally for you. But it also demonstrates to them, okay, this is someone who, you know, they spent their summer in a law firm rather than going on holiday with their friends. This is someone who is interested. But you you can demonstrate that through your academics as well and through your wider reading. I, I personally didn't have any work experience, um, any relevant work experience, but was still able to get an offer. Yeah. Um, so the, the way I teach this and the way I hope a lot of the people teach it as well is that... Um, universities are less interested in what we call extracurriculars and more interested in what we like to call supercurriculars. So supercurriculars are still extracurriculars, but they are directly linked to the course of which you wish to study. So uh, by way of example, uh, an extracurricular for law would be playing the cello to grade five or what have you. Uh, but then a supercurricular would be something like having read a book. So let's use The Rule of Law by Tom Bingham as an example. So that kind of book is something that you can develop skills that are useful for a legal degree, um, but also it is something that you can bring in and work into your personal statement to demonstrate the various different things that we want you to demonstrate in your personal statement. Um, so when it comes to CV, I wouldn't say that um, you need... You don't even need work experience, to be entirely honest with you, for law, I must say. Um, but you need to definitely be developing a list of things that you are doing that are these super curricular. So reading books, perhaps trying to see court live. Pretty difficult at the moment. Uh, as a practicing training solicitor, I can't even get into courts at the moment. I'm on Zoom. I've yet to make myself a cat. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I would consider... Um, trying to do things like watching Supreme Court videos online. Um, so the Supreme Court publishes their um, decisions. Uh, so you can watch the Uber decision from yesterday, which is very interesting from an employment law perspective. Um, or alternatively, you can do things like um, try and get involved in courses like the ones that uni admissions provide. So attend the lectures that uni admissions provide, um, which go into some interesting things. Like last year, I delivered a lecture on uh, wrongful life which is a very interesting area of medical law and ethics so there are various different things that you can do but I wouldn't be saying you need a CV as such but you need a wide breadth of super curricular activities. Fab thanks both. Um, ben mentioned the Supreme Court there um, this is something that comes up occasionally when I do um, see um, personal statement review um, if you're applying to study English law please don't bang on about the American Supreme Court um, it makes you look confused and unfocused. And while I enjoy reading the, the best of Scalia as much as everyone else, um, it's one of those things you want to uh, deal with once you've got in. Um, but if you're really excited to talk about American law and your English personal statement, um, it's not super convincing. You know, it's, it, it, it's like going on a date and talking about how much you fancy someone else the whole time, so to speak. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Danvin Narendra uh, asks, what um, sort of work experience do you think we will need? Um, so you touched on this a moment ago, Ben. Um, uh, you said you, you yourself didn't have much in the way of work experience when you applied. Um, what do you wish you had done? Um, what, what, what do you think you wish you had known? And what, and what, well, do, people, what do people you've, um, you've been at university with or, or on the, uh, the solicitors program with, what have they done that you sort of envy? Okay, so I think the first thing to say for applications to university is it's not like a medicine degree. Um, you don't need law, legal work experience. Yes, it's useful, but you don't need it. That will definitely be even more the case. And uh, I know from my friends who work in Oxford admissions, at least, they are taking into consideration over the next however long the various different impacts of COVID and one of those is going to be that you're not going to get in-person work experience it's completely unfair to expect that um, so you shouldn't need to worry about that um, however um, if you can get work experience by all means do I managed to get a week or two it was two weeks at a, um, a criminal firm 
in the west coast of Cumbria. Absolutely thrilling stories of <laughs> next to nothing. Um, however, um, still things that you can get involved in and understand the systems. Um, in terms of stuff that I wish I'd done before um, I went to uni, I, I wish, to be honest, I got involved in more programmes that told me what studying at university was going to be like um, and tried to do some courses that, you know, educated me in how I need to learn, how I learn best because they're really underestimated benefits that if you can quite clearly demonstrate how you learn, that is going to help you for your A-levels, but it's also going to help you throughout your degree. And that's something that I didn't really have a proper understanding of when I went to uni. I spent a long time trying to desperately work out how I learned. Um, so that's a fun one. Uh, otherwise, when you then get to university, so thinking about long-term, trying to get a job and work experience, that's where things do become more important. Um, that said, firms have specific programs. They have first year springboard programs, which you can get involved in. They have, um, after that, open days. They then have vacation schemes. So I was very lucky to get a vacation scheme at the end of my second year, which I then got offered a training contract from. Um, when you get to university, you'll have societies, the law society for the university that you go to, that will be able to support you and help you truly understand how you can make the most of those opportunities. But I definitely say the need for law work experience comes later than at the point of application, which I understand most of you are at. So do not worry too much. Thanks, Ben. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think this was probably before you were on the call, Ben. Um, I'm always a big fan of work experience for students for the simple reason that the best time to get divorced is before you get married. Um, it's not a good idea to spend five years training to become a barrister and to discover that you don't want to be a barrister. It's a bad idea to spend years of your life uh, training to do something only to discover you don't want to do it. Um, the easiest way to avoid this is to try it out first. Um, seek out work experience regardless of what um, level it's at, uh, whether the firm is prestigious, whether um, you think it's going to look great on your CV. Um, you're going to be working for an awfully long time, um, probably 40 to 50 years of your life. Um, it's a good idea to start trying out the stuff you do and don't like as early as you can, um, because there's nothing more miserable than having a job you hate, uh, which fortunately I don't. I quite like this job. Um, but, you know, I'm 31. It's taken me a little while to get here. If I had done work experience, perhaps I'd have got it quicker. You know, Will did. Maybe that was the value of work experience for him. Um, <laughs> So Maya Norse, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Maya, uh, asks, do we have experience with getting people into Irish universities such as Trinity? Can I practice in the UK afterwards? So this is unusually a question I know the answer to, um, which is I applied to Trinity um, 14 years ago uh, when I was 17, um, because my girlfriend at the time uh, was also applying to Trinity um, and I wanted to go with her because we were very much in love. Um, it didn't work out um, and I've married someone else subsequently, um, but that's a process that um, I'm fairly familiar with um, and I think is one that um, Will knows from a few students we've worked with applying to Ireland as well as the UK. Um, is that right, Will? So for medicine, I, I've spoken with students applying in Ireland for medicine because um, they have some they have some tests quite similar to what we have in the UK. I, I, I'm not so familiar about law in Dublin, so I, I don't know if there's, I mean, if, if they require the LNAT, then of course that is something we can support you with. But if, if their application process is wildly different, then um, I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure. Yeah, so the process is somewhat different um, in that it's much more ranked based on, um, in the case of Ireland, leaving certain results. Um, and those get kind of converted from A-levels and other qualifications. But um, mm -hmm. uh, Ben, you flagged that you're knowledgeable here. Interesting. Um, knowledgeable. Yeah. Um, the comment that I was going to add was on the second part of the question. So um, in terms of qualifying to then practice in the UK, um, again, this is very much like if you were in Scotland the situation there. So you would qualify and be a qualified um, solicitor or barrister, at whatever stage you got to in Ireland, uh, specifically Republic of. Um, but then you would be able to transfer across the United Kingdom. Um, but again, you would need to do a course quite like the LPC 
including the GDL. Um, so I know that Matt and Will mentioned this briefly before um, in terms of um, the route to becoming a solicitor and the whole do a law degree if you want to, don't do a law degree if you don't want to. Um, that very much is still something that is a very good message. The only thing that's slightly changing somewhat is that the courses are changing from the GDL and um, the LP. PC in the case of becoming a solicitor to um, a law master's quite like the GDL and then a super exam so the specific uh, solicitor qualifying exam which is being run by the SRA and being phased in from this year um, the point is though when it comes back to Ireland is um, if you wanted to do that law degree in Ireland it would almost be like doing a non-legal degree in England and Wales which you would then do the top up degree in the English and Welsh system, followed by the solicitor qualification exam. So it doesn't mean that you can't practice in the UK. It just means you've got one extra hurdle to jump over, which a lot of law firms will help fund and get you through in any case. Yeah. Um, again, oh, Matt, sorry. is it okay if I have a question for Ben? Uh, uh, sure, <laughs> go ahead. So, so um, I was thinking about this while you were talking, Ben, because so in medicine, uh, there's sort of, the, if you have a medical degree in the UK, that's a relatively strong degree and is more, you can more or less then study any, you can then practice anywhere, maybe with a short course to, to convert or something like that. Whereas if you studied medicine in, uh, let's say, Kuwait, that, that, that's not as strong and, and you'd have to go through significantly longer retraining to be able to then study in places like the UK. Is there, is there the same kind of ranking of strength of legal degree or, or is it all you basically, wherever you study, you can do one or two years to then re reconvert to a new country? So it is essentially that you do a couple of years to then convert. Uh, the, the one um, disclaimer alert. Um, can you tell I'm a lawyer? Um, anyway, <laughs> the, the big thing is uh, there are kind of two distinct kinds of legal system in the world. One of them is a civil legal system, which kind of stems, its history comes from the Roman Empire, and it's about codifying what you can and can't do. And you almost need to find laws that say you can do things in those kinds of places. And you'll find that kind of um, legal system is very kind of popular in Europe, France, their civil code, for instance. Um, so if you were to train in a kind of jurisdiction that is civil and try and convert into a common law jurisdiction, such as the UK, Scotland, I'm not sure about Ireland in terms of the Republic of Ireland. Uh, I, but I, then I believe also, it's, a common, it's an inherited common law system as well. OK, cool. Uh, so, yeah, that's also the same in terms of Australia, New Zealand, lots of other places, basically where the Commonwealth went and did our terrible things. Um, however, that is another conversation. Yeah, so I've done, while you've all been talking, I've done a little bit of further research into the question on Trinity, which I was interested in. Um, so according to the um, Solicitors uh, Registration Association, I think that's what SRA stands for, um, you can be exempted from the conversion um, if you've been to Trinity, if you have done um, a couple of extra modules on English law. Um, I don't know if that carries over, um, given the, the ruptures that have been happening between the UK and Ireland in uh, recent months. Um, but generally speaking, the, the convertibility between the two is, is fairly good. Um, and Dublin is a marvellous city, very expensive, uh, but cheaper than London. Um, weather's worse but there's a, there's a lot to be said for it. excellent pubs um and that's why i would encourage anyone to apply to trinity it is apparently very nice um and had i not been dumped i would have gone there uh but it seemed rude to be dumped and then go there anyway um, there are matt there are a couple of questions about sort of costs of the course that we offer yeah. um and there's also something about it worth supporting international students first thing i wanted to say is, and, and I said this before, naturally the specifics of what an individual student will need will depend on them, will depend on the support that they have already from school, from their parents, what work they've done on the application so far, all these different variables. So actually the, the, the program that I would recommend for an individual uh, can vary quite a lot. 
Um, so naturally, it's, it's much better for us to have a conversation, um, you know, book a consultation as the, hopefully the GIF is still showing. Uh, and we'll be able to have a proper chat about what is going to be best for you. Um, for international applicants, we do support a, a lot of international students, um, some with more uh, manageable time zones, some with less manageable time zones. But generally speaking, wherever you are, we will be able to support you. Your tutorials will be done at times that work for you. Uh, and we'll, we will be able to find tutors or, or one of our tutors from our tutor pool will be able to uh you know work along that time schedule the main thing is the enrichment seminars you know it, it, it might be that you're watching them early on a sunday morning or late on a sunday evening rather than at that 2 p.m slot where the, where the uk portuguese students are watching it um ben have you had many international students that you've helped over the years uh, yep so i've got one person out in um Bangladesh at the moment um, who's applying this coming season um, otherwise I've worked with some people um, not just in the UK I think the majority of my students last year were not in the UK actually I'm gonna have one UK and then two outside of UK so yeah it's a fairly standard thing for our cheaters to do and um, it's absolutely something we can do okay we're actually, I mean, so we've, we've, we're out of questions at the moment. So if anyone sat there uh, wondering about anything yeah. about law, certainly worth sending across a question yeah, for Ben. Please, please do come in. We're paying Ben good money to be here. And if he doesn't have anything to do, <laughs> oh, scandalous. I'll be, I'll be really annoyed. Um, I'll have to make him talk to me for, for 20 minutes for money. Um, um, so where does that leave us? Um, so questions that we were sort of expecting to be asked. Uh, Will, can you talk us to us a little bit about the um, differences between the LNAT and the Cambridge Law Test? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the CLT, uh, obviously the, the LNAT has two parts, the sort of multiple choice section and then the essays. Uh, the CLT is effectively just that second part. Um, so naturally there's, you know, different things to be preparing for. Um, and one other difference is the, the LNAT, you'd usually sit a couple of months before your interview. Um, also, probably before you send off your application. Um, whereas the CLT, uh, you'd usually sit it pretty much on the day of your interview. Um, so before last year, students would go to Oxford or Cambridge for their interviews. They'd stay there for a few days. Um, you know, go to hall and, and, and enjoy the experience and have the very, very stressful interviews as part of that. And you do the CLT then. This last year when things were done, uh, when interviews were done virtually, uh, the CLT was, I think, sort of four or five days before the actual interview. So it was slightly before, um, but not like the LNAT, which is well in advance. Fab, thanks very much. Um, we've had a question from uh, Maya Norse about the EPQ. Um, now, they haven't invented the EPQ uh, when I was at school. Uh, they haven't invented the A-star either. Um, it was a very long time ago. That's just um, what your teacher said to make you feel less bad, Matt. <laughs> God, I've, I realise I've been betrayed. Um, uh, ben, did you do an EPQ? And if you didn't, uh, do you know about them anyway? Um, and then I've got a, an island-specific bit of information on the EPQ for... For Maya as well, that I'll come back to. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, extended project qualification. Um, essentially, for those of you who don't know, it is an essay on a subject that you choose, essentially. Um, so, this comes back to what I was saying about um, supercurriculars. This is an example of a supercurricular if you are doing an essay that is legally based. So, it's a fantastic thing to do if you won't want to talk about it on your personal statement. Uh, it can certainly help prompt some early questions in interviews in certain circumstances. So you might mention that you've done an EPQ on, um, I don't know, uh, supported one student recently who had done her EPQ on um, rights for women giving birth in prison, um, which is an interesting topic and one that she was able to work into her personal statement. Um, so essentially, uh, they are morsels to discuss with an interview, but they can also be really useful for personal statements. And it also, again, genuinely shows you are interested in law because that's what you're doing 
the EPQ for. So yeah, it's definitely something that is useful, um, particularly if it's legally based. Fantastic, thanks, Ben. Um, as Ben says, as we talked about earlier, um, uh, doing well in the LNAP particularly is all about developing skills rather than developing knowledge and the EPQ is a really good way to practice that kind of um, uh, that kind of set of reasoning, those kinds of legal skills. And you can also pick up some some knowledge as well, which is nice. Um, um, on the question of Ireland, because I, I, I believe it was you, Mai, who asked about it earlier. This is where I, I fact check myself and look silly. Um, no, it was you. Excellent. Um, uh, so in the um, Irish admission system, they um, at Trinity are happy to count the EPQ for a mark, uh, which is different from the way these things are done at Oxbridge. So you can um, sneak yourself in an extra A or extra A star um, by doing the EPQ if you're applying for Trinity, uh, which is a good trick, um, given how competitive um, admissions to Trinity can be, because you've got all of the smartest kids of Ireland to fight with as well. One thing as well, Matt, that I've just kind of popped into my brain. Um, the EPQ is really useful for people who have done typically science based courses who are looking to then do law or mathematics, that kind of thing, something which you don't normally write an extended essay for. So when it comes to additional or adding skills to your feather in your or adding a feather to your cap, whatever you want to call it, um, if you are a science based person who has had their correct epiphany that law is for them, um, <laughs> then you is definitely something to consider. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's something I, I talk about in the context of my personal regrets occasionally in these oddly personal seminars. Um, it's much easier to become a, um, to be a scientist who has a grasp of the humanities than a humanities grad who has a grasp of the sciences. Um, if you're uncertain, doing maths and chemistry and history is a, is a much better bet than doing English history and art um, because you'll keep your options open at A level in a way that the humanities tend to close them off a little bit, particularly with regards to um, subjects like law. Um, Humza, uh, uh, Humza Malik asks, oh no, it's just a compliment, how marvellous. She says it was a great presentation. Well done, Will. Uh, it's uh, well done me, how beautifully I've redesigned these slides. Um, how different are the ways in which the individual colleges at Oxbridge review their applicants? Do some colleges favour certain attributes over others, and do they look out for these? Um, so, Will, you'll have some views, uh, I'm sure, and Ben, if you can follow up from Will. Yes, so um, generally it, it varies a bit from Oxford to Cambridge. Uh, Oxford is a bit more standardised in the approach that they have for applicants, whereas Cambridge colleges do do things slightly a bit more, uh, they do have a bit more uh, difference between them. Uh, generally speaking, you know, if, if you're a good applicant for one college, you'll be a good applicant for another. You know, they're, they're gem they are looking for this kind of skills and abilities uh, uh, across the board, but they, they might have different ways of testing that. So uh, from my background, you might have one college which interviews and they use, um, so you, you go into the interview and your first thing is you read through a scientific paper for half an hour before you actually have the interview. And then the interview is quite a lot based on that. Because for that admissions tutor, obviously they're quite interested in the way that you're able to handle that kind of thing. Whereas at another uh, interview at a different college, there might not be any paper. Um, they might just have their own set of questions that they want to ask you. Um, and again, it, it's sort of, it's more or less down to the individual admissions tutor as to how they want to run that. Um, but you will then be scored um, as you know, your LNAT is uh, quantitative, your interview performance will be scored. Um, and when it comes to pooling, generally speaking, they're, they're all mostly looking at you on the same terms. So, so when I say pooling, that is to say, if you apply to Balliol, and Balliol has five places and 15 interviewees, and just by chance, 10 of them were absolutely superb. Um, the, the, the five that Balliol can't give places to, Balliol would then go to the others and say, hey, look, these guys are pretty good. We think you should consider them. These are how well they did at interview. This is how well they did at test. Um, and so, you know, when it, when it comes to that point, again, then you're more or less all, you're being sort of seen a bit more quantitatively. 
um, and it will be generally reviewed the same. Like I said, Cambridge do do things differently. Some colleges ask for more uh, pieces of written work to be submitted. Some colleges ask for none. Uh, some colleges have additional admissions tests at interview where there aren't any, some have none. So it is a bit more different. But again, like I said at the start, generally speaking, if you're a good applicant for one college, you should be a good applicant for, for, for all of them. Fab. Thanks, Will. Uh, we've had a question in the chat um, about... No, Matt, I don't know if Ben has anything to add more oh, specifically. Well, oh, I'm, I'm already talking. I'll finish. Um, uh, cool. We do record them. Um, they'll be on the website in a couple of days. We have to edit the video first. Um, so do check in for that if you've missed some of it. Ben, I'm sorry for cutting across you. It's quite all right. Could have styled it out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so um, in terms of what I have to say on that, broadly completely agree um cambridge essentially as i understand it the central law faculty has less of an input which means there is as it's been said less standardization whereas at oxford although you apply directly to colleges and the colleges make those decisions uh, there is a pooling system that happens literally while you are interviewing and also before you are interviewing so it can happen that you apply to st hugh's college just bigging it up because that's where i went um so say you apply for st hugh's um but st hugh's is grossly oversubscribed um so they will put you into the pool the law faculty will then review those applications they'll send them around to different colleges um that means that you could then go and interview at that college uh, so a new college so let's say Magdalen. um Maudlin then look at you and think okay you know this this candidate is strong but unfortunately we've got six really strong candidates and you are number seven and we've only got six places so you could then be put back into the pool and have another interview at a different college and sometimes it even happens that you get an offer for a college that you haven't even interviewed at don't ask me how that works but I've seen it happen <laughs> Um, so with Oxford, it's very much more centrally done and they try to make sure that the questions are roughly the same. Um, when I say roughly the same, I mean, in form, not in literal question. Uh, so for instance, they will try and get you to be set a certain kind of, um, reading task before one interview, and then you might have no reading before another one. Um, but yeah, so broadly speaking, very much agree. Um, the one thing I would say about certain colleges favouring certain attributes, I do know tutors personally. I do know that some of them prefer certain characteristics of people, um, but they are not the important things that tutors are looking for. They'll only kind of go down to, oh, I like this one. He was a bit more, or she was a bit more um, defensive in their opinion. Um, that might just be something that one tutor likes, whereas another tutor would be, annoyed that you were sticking to your gun so much so uh, to be honest i wouldn't overthink that i would just be you and do your very best um we're um not running out of time but we are running out of questions um so please drop some more questions in um otherwise um i'm going to ask ben uh what it is that he was expecting to be asked that uh, we didn't ask him and i'm going to drop in uh, my favorite part of the week which is polling people on the vaccine um, because it makes me feel warm inside. Um, the you know spirit of human progress and perhaps eventual freedom uh, for our present predicament. Uh, but Ben, what was it that you were expecting to be asked that we have not asked you? Um, and then if you can answer it, um, and then we'll probably we'll probably go home where we already are. I normally get asked what's the one thing that I can do now to make sure that I get into Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, there is no magic ticket, I can tell you that much. Um, but one thing I would just reiterate that I've mentioned before is really think about developing your super curriculars. So think about things that you haven't done, be it reading books, be it trying to read some case law, be it trying to get involved in some jurisprudential theories. That's kind of philosophy that is legally more legal related um so just try and do the things that you realize and accept you need to improve yourself on um particularly if you think of it from the perspective of how are you going to show the tutors that you are suitable for this course 
at this university. So in the case of Oxford, also in Cambridge, they'll have a number of qualitative um, admissions criteria, which were referred to shortly beforehand uh, in terms of so for Oxford, that there are three of them. It's about application and your ability to you know, really focus in difficult circumstances and produce really high quality work. Um, it's also about clear communication. So if you feel like you haven't done super curriculars that help demonstrate your suitability in terms of communication, get on it. You've got time. This is the time to be doing it. Um, and otherwise, if you feel that you haven't got things that show that you are, can really critically analyse, which is the other final qualitative um, thing that Oxford look for, again, get on it. See if you can do some debating club at school. Um, see if you can get involved in uh, writing an EPQ, which shows your you know, critical analysis. Just do the things that if you sit down now and go, OK, what super curriculars have I got? If you can recognise gaps fill the gaps, get some polyfiller of an educational variety um, and, and work away on it. Fab. Um, I think that brings us to the end of what we're going to do today. Um, I'm sorry about the subtitles, Maya. This is a, a known problem. Um, they work for me, but for no one else, um, because I'm the host. It's, it's, it's frustrating. Um, we're looking into a solution, but as yet we haven't found it. Um, but thank you everyone for coming along. Um, the good news is that um, we've got very nice news on the vaccine. Um, almost everyone has um, knows at least five people who've had it. Some people have had it themselves. Uh, and there was only one person who didn't know anyone who had had it. Um, I hope that the people you know uh, get hold of the vaccine soon or uh, you ask because in theory, there should be some. Um, or you're in a part of the world where it's less widely available, in which case we, we look forward to it being distributed to you uh, through the Gavi and the COVAX schemes. Um, so as I say, that brings us to the end. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, you're getting away with, with a whole 15 minutes of, of not having to do any work for money. Uh, you must be delighted. Yeah, brilliant. I can go and see whether the red car that's just been given correctly, because it was for West Brom. Um, so it doesn't really matter whether it was right or not, uh, is correct. So Fab, well, I'm going to do that I'm, now. I say I'm looking forward to seeing what new depths of, um, of mediocrity Bournemouth are exploring. Um, but goodbye, Ben. Um, Will, uh, say goodbye as well, please. Yeah, bye, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Thanks for your time, Ben. Have a great weekend. No bye. problem. Have a good weekend, folks. Bye, guys. Yeah. Have a lovely weekend. And um, please join us again next week when we'll be talking about applying to study PPE and economics, the degrees of prime ministers. Um, have a lovely weekend. It's goodbye from me as well. <laughs>